everybody. And thanks, Ken and Marshall, wherever you are. <laughs> the acoustics are not very good in back, and I haven't any idea what Marshall said to you, but I'm sure that 90% of it was inaccurate. <laughs> As you may or may not know, uh, when you reach the 80th milestone, it's dangerous to get in front of a microphone because everything you say reminds you of something else. <laughs> and when I reached 80, I decided that I would never again prepare a speech. And then when I passed my 85th milestone, I decided I would never again attempt to make one. <laughs> and now that I'm in my 90th year, I imagine that some of my friends think that I should be over at the Myron Stratton, uh, <laughs> what, what do you call it, rest, the Myron uh, Stratton home, sitting in a rocking chair watching the world go by. Instead, uh, here I am. I think I did hear Marshall say something to the effect that I hadn't thought about retiring. Actually, and this is not very important, but I'm still, I still have a daily radio program. I'm involved in a television series. I'm working on a, another motion picture, which I hope will be the most important one that I've ever made. I, uh, I happen to be involved in a corporation that controls television and radio stations, newspapers and magazines. And uh, when I leave here, and that reminds me of something. <laughs> you know, wherever I go, well, coming in on the plane last night, I was reading in the, uh, the plane magazine, it's something to the effect that nearly all of us were interested in knowing how people of great wealth, two things we wanted to know was how they got it and then uh, how they spent it. Well, I find that nearly everywhere I go, I'm asked not two questions, but I'm asked three. One question is, where are you coming from? The second one is, where are you going? And the third one is, where haven't you been? <laughs> and uh, I've been thinking about that and I have been fortunate in getting around the globe a good deal, some 30 times around the world, and both to the North and South Poles a number of times, and to almost every country on the planet. And I was trying to think of where I hadn't been, and it occurred to me that I'd never been to Pueblo, Colorado. A moment ago, a youngster came up to me who was the grandson of a former governor of Colorado. He's sitting out here now. He's the grandson of Governor Ralph Carr. And Ralph Carr and I were rival editors long, long ago. And uh, we were also pals until his death. And the, uh, the picture that the young man brought up to me is one that I'll prize. Now, I'll tell you about it in a moment. A few nights ago, I was introducing uh, the president's, one of his number one advisors, Ed Meese, at a banquet in uh, Washington. Ed Meese, of course, is very close to President Reagan, telling him what to do at times. And it reminded me that I started advising presidents 81 years ago, <laughs> uh, when I was eight years old. Teddy Roosevelt came up to the Cripple Creek District during a campaign. That was when Brian was running on uh, a platform in favor of free silver. And the miners were all enthusiastic about Brian and his campaign. And they were not at all enthusiastic about Teddy Roosevelt. And that has something to do with this picture. 
when Teddy got up there, he was met at the station, and they were angry, these miners were. And it looked as though they were going to mob him. And one miner lifted up a two-by-four, you all know what a two-by-four is, and had it in the air and was going to bring it down on Teddy's head. And that was when I gave Teddy Roosevelt some advice. I said, hey, look out. <laughs> And, and this, and th the man who really stopped this chap from bringing that uh, boom down on T.R.'s head was the postmaster, Danny Sullivan. And this is a picture of Danny and Ralph Carr and s several more of us taken long, long ago. Uh, Danny is not living, Ralph Carr is gone. In fact, all of the people that are in this picture, they're gone. But Danny Sullivan, uh, several months later, received a beautiful gold watch from Teddy Roosevelt. And he would take it out at all times, whether he was invited to do so or not, he, <laughs> uh, to show people, because on the inside of it, it said, to Danny Sullivan, the man who saved my life. Now, uh, Here's another thing. I, I mentioned that I decided never to prepare a speech. Oh, yes, here's my hat. That reminds me of something. <laughs> I've been wearing a Stetson hat, uh, not for, uh, this is my 90th year, not quite all that time, but most of it. I started wearing Stetsons long, long ago, and I've always worn one no matter what part of the world I was in. And I've left them all over the world. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I understand Jenny, General Kelly is sitting here somewhere, and he might be interested in this. I left a, General, I left a, a particularly fine Stetson hat. You know, the quality of a Stetson hat depends upon the number of beaver that are involved in the making of the hat. And this was one that had been given to me by some organization in the East, and it was a hat worth well over $100. And I left it on a barroom stool at the Majestic Hotel in Saigon. And about six months after that, General, I received a letter from an Air Force colonel in Louisiana. He said, I'm wearing a Stetson hat with your name in it, and you're not about to get it back. <laughs> you people are... Uh, awfully lucky who live in Colorado Springs. I've roamed the world, of course, and have come in contact with wonderful places all over this planet. But Colorado Springs is rather special, second only to the Cripple Creek District, of course. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to mention to you was this. Many years ago, uh, when General Kelly was a second lieutenant in the Air Force, I went into the Secretary for Air's office in Washington to borrow what was then the largest airplane in the world, a Globemaster. Had a little difficulty borrowing it, incidentally, but <laughs> I, I finally managed. Well, when I went into the, uh, Harold Talbot, I believe, was Secretary for Air at the time. And he had just come in from a trip around America. He and Lindbergh and one other person had been sent out to scout all over America for where an Air Force Academy should be built. And um, Talbot was telling me about this, and he said that they, they had worked it down to three places. One was San Antonio, Texas. The other one, I've forgotten what it was. That was, seemed unimportant to me, but the third was Colorado Springs. And I said to Secretary Talbot, there's no, no problem here at all. I can tell you where it's going to be. And of course, that's where it is, the, the ideal spot in Colorado Springs. When I was a youngster up in the Cripple Creek District, Colorado Springs in those days had a population of about 20,000 people. We had something like 70,000 up there. And, uh, Colorado Springs in those days, as many of you know, although I can tell by looking at it, it's rather dark. I really can't see as clearly as I wish I could because 
uh, when you don't know what you're going to talk about and you really don't know what you're talking about anyhow, uh, you, you really have to get some of your inspiration from your audience. And I like to have the lights on so that I can, I can see everybody. But this is an old auditorium that is about to be torn down and they can't turn the lights any higher than they are now. So you're sort of, sort of in the semi-darkness. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Colorado Springs is, in those days, we, as I said, we called it Little London, and we had that much larger population up there, but we ra rather scoffed at, uh, at the effete people who lived down here. It was, uh, it was supposed to be a, a great watering place for people from England in those days. And uh, you can imagine what miners thought about something of that sort. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons why we thought Colorado Springs wasn't too important. Anyhow, I think you're incredibly lucky to live here because this is one of the most glorious places on the planet. Well, and by the way, uh, some people are under the impression that, that I was born in Colorado. Actually, a few years ago, the governor of Ohio, Governor Rhodes, gave a banquet in Columbus. I'm sure it had uh, political overtones. <laughs> he had about a thousand people there, but uh, those at the head table were all born in Ohio. There were three or four who had received the Nobel Prize. There were dignitaries like Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, great athletes like Jesse Owens, and so on. A terrific array of people. And as we were served our coffee, Governor Rhodes came and leaned over my shoulder. And he said, Lowell, in a little bit, I'm going to ask you to tell about your experiences and your impressions of Ohio when you lived here. And then he stepped away, and I didn't have a chance to explain to him that Although I was born in Ohio, as soon as I discovered where I was, I left for Colorado. <laughs> that's, um, that's a slight exaggeration, but we, we made... Uh, my father was a, a surgeon, and uh, we made a stop midway across the continent in Iowa. That reminds me of something. <laughs> On uh, President Hoover's, the anniversary of his 100th birthday, he was born in Iowa, as you know, and I was asked to be the speaker on that 100th anniversary, and it was out beside his grave on a little hilltop in the middle of the state. And I had a crowd of perhaps a 1,000 people or so around me, and, and um, as I stood there, it was in August, I believe the 10th of August, as I stood there, I was looking out for miles and miles and miles in all directions, and all I could see was waving green corn. And that must have made a great impression on me, greater than I even realized, because a little bit later, an Associated Press correspondent asked me to what I owed my longevity. And I looked around at all this corn, and I said, I think it's the corn liquor that I use. <laughs> and of course, I only said that because I was looking out over these vast cornfields. But that, that item went around the world <laughs> that, I, that I had said that it was corn liquor. And that reminds me of something. Uh, we oftentimes get publicity uh, when we are not really looking for it, not expecting it, and, and not wanting it. Some time ago, and by the way, this uh, will give you an idea that I'm a name dropper, which of course is true, because in my line of work, you're coming in contact with unusual people all the time. So naturally, you're, you constantly refer to them. Uh, those of us who are involved in the world of communications, journalism, I don't use the word journalism really because a journalist is a reporter out of work. But uh, anyhow, I, I oftentimes make references to unusual people, and I will in this uh, comment. I had uh, another chap and I brought a, a rare one-horned rhino back from the foothills of the Himalayas some years ago. 
a rhino that is, may, not, may disappear before too long. And we, we planned on bringing two of them back because we thought we'd raise rhino. We brought just one and we gave it to the zoo in Miami named Mohan. That was the name of the rhino that we gave that name. And uh, sometime after that, I was on my way to South America. And I thought, well, I'm going by Miami. I might as well stop at the Miami Zoo and see how our rhino is getting on. And I made a mistake. I called the director of the zoo on the phone, told him I was coming, not realizing that that would mean anything. But when I got there, I found that he had rounded up all the newspaper people in that end of Florida and television and radio people as well, because he was conducting a fund drive <laughs> for, the, for the zoo. And he wanted to take advantage of this rather odd thing of my coming to, to say hello to a rhinoceros. <coughs> and the rhino was out in a small stockade, <coughs> and the bars were about so. And it was possible for the rhino to just get his snout through those bars. <coughs> but anyhow, while I was talking to these correspondents, I turned my back to the stockade, and the rhino got me by the seat of the pants. And a picture of that was taken, and it was printed all over the world. <laughs> Actually, and this is where the name dropping comes in, I got a clipping sent to me by the former king of Belgium, King Leopold, who with a friend of mine named Heinrich Harrer, a great Himalayan mountaineer, they were on their way to Ethiopia to do some climbing in Africa. And in Khartoum, they saw this picture of me, uh, the, the rhino had me by the seat of the pants in, in the Khartoum paper, which they sent to me. But the thing I remember particularly about that incident was a, a chap from Detroit who used to write the comedy material for a team that you're all too young to remember named Stupnagel and Bud long, long ago. Uh, he wrote to me from uh, Detroit, and his opening sentence I'll never forget. He said, what do you say to a man who's been bitten in the ass by a rhinoceros? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's, uh, um, by the way, um, I was invited to come here over a year ago, and my recollection of it was that uh, Cantor, one of his colleagues, had told me that they would like to have me talk about my early days in Colorado. I, I'm sure that my memory is a little because I left Colorado 77 years ago. But I'll try and re remember a little of it. And if I find that uh, I can't remember some of the things, I'll, I'll turn around and ask Marshall Sprague. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, Marshall could tell you more about the Cripple Creek District than I could. He wrote a book about it some years ago. Or, of course, it would be great if I had uh, an old friend named Rufus Porter here. He used to be a reporter on the Colorado Springs papers. I think they, I think they called him Hard Rock. And he used to write a great deal about the mining up in the Cripple Creek District. And then I had a school teacher up there named Mabel Barbie Lee. Uh, she was a, a teacher in high school, a lovely, red-haired, most attractive young woman. And uh, we were all very fond of uh, Mabel. I lost track of her for years, but I did hear that she had come down to Colorado Springs, became the Dean of Women at Colorado College, and then she had a promotion. She went to Harvard, well, to an adjunct of Harvard, a women's college called Radcliffe, where she again was Dean of Women. And then she went and was one of the people that organized a rather famous institution, a women's college at Bennington, Vermont. And uh, at the, in the days when she was at Bennington, I happened to encounter her, and I, I said to her, Mabel, you have a talent for writing. Why don't you start doing some books? So I prodded her until I finally got her to start writing. And as some of you know, she wrote a series of wonderful books. Uh, the one that she did called Cripple Creek Days is, is really superb. If you haven't read it, I hope you can find a copy somewhere. Anyhow. Uh, Mabel Barbie Lee uh, knew a lot about that country, like Marshall Sprague does and Rufus Porter. When I got there, we stopped off in, in Iowa for a short time. 
And my father had a brother who was a mining engineer up in the Cripple Creek District. And that was why he had lured my father there. And he became a, a mining surgeon. And uh, that's where I spent so many of my early years. And I've always really regarded myself as a native of Colorado, although I have two ch chief claims to fame. One is that I was born next door to Annie Oakley in Ohio. And uh, also, my Sunday school teacher, and you're too young to know who she was, my Sunday school teacher up in the Cripple Creek District was a gal named Texas Guinan. <laughs> I see a few of you know who she was. <laughs> Texas Guinan, General, you're probably too young to know. She went east and became very famous during the Prohibition era. She was the most notorious gal in America during that period. She was the one who used that term, hello sucker, you know, to all people who came into the place over which she presided in New York. Well, so much for that. Oh, yes, there's another thing. People in the East oftentimes are a little startled when they hear me say that I spent part of my life in an ore house. They, uh, <laughs> they, not familiar with mining terms, they, 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 they don't know that what I meant was that I, I used to sort gold ore on the Vindicator Mine and the, and the Tornado Mine and the Empire State Mine and the Portland Mine, and uh, I worked in an ore house. But they, they, they uh, misinterpret that term. <laughs> I, I was going to tell you that, well, since I've mentioned that, I might as well say that the first mine I worked on was called the Empire State. It was up at 11,000 feet. And I, I worked underground with an Irishman named Ed Cody, and those were the days of high grading. And they really did it on quite a scale, too. We were working on what was called the Buna vein, which in those days was reputed to be the richest gold vein that had ever been discovered in America. The ore ran $36,000 to the ton. Just the raw as they blasted it out in this tunnel. And uh, the man on the water liner drill in the tunnel where I was working, I, I was doing the tramming, and uh, Ed Cody was running the drill, and he was high grading. But I never gave it away because youngsters, you know, I think are usually a little bit that way. They don't want to turn somebody in, and, which I didn't do. But a little later on, Ed Cody uh, resigned from his job as a miner. And uh, th the last I heard of him was he'd gone to Denver, where he chartered a train, not just one car. He chartered a train and took his pals on a trip to the West Coast. And that's the way things were going in the Cripple Creek District part of the time in those days. I also, uh, for, for some time, I, I had an interesting job working with the Portland Mine, which was the richest of all the gold mines in the Cripple Creek District. I, I had a horse that I rode for nine hours a day over the mountains to all the other lesser mines, and not all of them, but to a great many of them, picking up samples that I brought back to the assay office at the Portland Mine. And then uh, after these samples were assayed, the next day I would take the returns, as they called it, back to these miners, usually sad news that they really hadn't struck it rich. And it was quite an experience to come in contact with all these miners. And I got some of my interest, I suppose, in travel from that because uh, gold miners, as you may or may not know, used to be, and of course things have changed when FDR took us off the gold standard, it changed things. But gold miners, for the most part, were a race of rather adventurous men. They were nearly all from the northern Nordic countries. A great many of them were from the British Isles, from Wales and Cornwall, Ireland, Scotland, England, and so on. And um, many of them, they, they really were not mining in order to make a day's wage. They were mining in order to get a grub stick so that they could go out and look for their pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And these miners, had uh, some of them had sought for gold in Honduras, Venezuela, Peru. Some of them had been on the Trail of 98 to the Klondike. Some had been on the Transvaal in South Africa. A few had even gotten to the Lena River in Siberia, searching for gold. 
And after we would do our day's work down underground, we'd sit there sometimes for an hour or so. After the fuses, since we hadn't touched them off yet, but they were all set. And we'd sit there and they would tell stories of their, their experiences in hunting for gold all over the world. And that gave me a, a rather special interest in going places. Also, where we lived up there in the Cripple Creek District from our, we lived in a number of different houses, incidentally. The one that has been labeled with my, uh, my name on it, and it's on postal cards, or it has been on postal cards, was really the last one and was not the most important place where we lived. But anyhow, from the window of one of our homes, we could see in three directions for about 100 miles, the great Sangre de Cristo range in the distance. And uh, I'm sure that I was always wondering what was on the other side of that great range. So a little bit later on when I could get away, I, I went to find out. But I, I went off, uh, oh, I'll tell you. Well, I went away to college first, and I went back to Indiana. And uh, after I had succeeded in picking up a couple of degrees, I came back to the mines in Cripple Creek. And I found that when I had a, a BA and an MBA, M, MA, that I was well qualified to use a pick and shovel. <laughs> so I went back to work in the mines. But after I'd been working for a short time, the owner of the Cripple Creek Times, which was quite a vigorous paper in those days, his name was Kiner, George Kiner, he called me up one day. I'd worked for him before, as a matter of fact. I'd carried newspapers. That reminds me of something. <laughs> I had a, a newspaper route that, where I had to get up about 3 o'clock in the morning, and, and uh, the red light district was part of my, my area. And I, can, I got a little education out of that. <laughs> uh, not that I really knew anything about what it was all about, but occasionally, as I was going along the row, a door would open and some miner would come bursting out of it with a woman in a nightgown uh, with a bottle that she threw at him. That's the kind of education I got out of that. Well, anyhow, uh, I, I delivered papers and sold them in the saloons because every other room was every other place and uptown was a, a saloon or a gambling hall in those early days. And uh, that reminds me of something too. One day I made a big mistake. All, all my life I've made a lot of mistakes. And uh, on one occasion, when I was in my early teens and there was a lot of snow on the ground, another chap and I, we were throwing snowballs from an alley at people going by. And uh, one target that looked particularly uh, interesting was a chap going by wearing a derby hat. And I happened to be lucky, and with my snowball, I, I knocked off his derby hat. But I'd picked the wrong person. He had been a, a shortstop on a semi-pro ball team. <laughs> and he could run faster than I could. And uh, he got me and took me to the, to the jail. That's the first time that I was taken to jail. I've been, to, I've been taken to jail four times in my life. And always, and this is very unimportant, but still I might as well tell you about it. Uh, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale is the head of an organization that honors uh, Horatio Alger. And every year they have a big banquet and they present Horatio Alger plaques to men who got a start in life, sometimes fellows who started as newsboys and then became heads of great corporations and so on, or whatever they did that was important. And uh, anyhow, uh, I, uh, I said at one of these banquets that there was always an audience of young people, and I said to the young people, well, they made me the last speaker at the banquet. And I had to listen to a whole lot of eminent men tell about their Horatio Alger careers and how they owed so much to their dear old mother and their father and so on. And it kind of got me down. <laughs> and by the time they got around to me, I, I was in a mood to do something a little different. And I explained to the young people, I said, uh, I don't want to advocate that you go to jail, but uh, don't, don't be too much disturbed if you do because you, you may encounter some very interesting people there. It may have a good influence on your life. 
it had on mine. For instance, I, I went to jail once in Ohio. It was over something, little thing that I'd done. And the man who arrested me that night remained my, my friend and all his life until he died. But, and uh, you, you sometimes get great opportunities that come out of uh, going to prison. So don't, uh, don't be too alarmed if you do. <laughs> that is the kind of advice I gave the Horatio Alger crowd. <laughs> and Dr. Peel never told me whether he approved of it. But I don't know how to get back to Cribble Creek, which is a little difficult now. I, I returned to Cripple Creek after I'd picked up a couple of degrees, and then I went to work. George Kiner called me and asked me how much I was earning working in the mines. And, and I told him it, it, it was a standard wage in those days, $3 a day. And, uh, and we worked 30 days a month. And uh, so uh, I got uh, roughly $90. And he said, uh, I'll give you 95 or 97 or something like that to go to work for me. So I went to work for him, editing a paper. And after I'd been editing that paper for several months, a group of financiers from Denver came up to the Cripple Creek District and started another paper. And they offered me more money to be the editor of their paper, so I did. Whereupon, George Kiner, in order to knock me off, hired a brilliant young man who had just left the University of Colorado, a lawyer, whose name was Ralph Carr. And he hired Ralph to be the editor to, to be my opposition. And Ralph and I became, we, we had our little stormy struggle together, but we became great pals and remained so for the rest of our lives. And uh, during that period, I, I had several experiences that I'll never forget. I recall on one occasion there was a fire and a number of buildings were burned, not the whole town. And I was a little bit green as a newspaper man. And I played it up too big on the first page of the paper. I, I wasn't satisfied with the ordinary type that would be used for that purpose. I went to the back of the, to the building and I got out some of the type that's generally used in ads, you know, great big letters. And I put that on the first page. And that afternoon, a man came into the, into the office and said that he would like to take a look at the afternoon paper. He did. And then he introduced himself to me. He said his name was Fred Arkins and that he, he was an advertising man from New York and that he had previously been the editor of this paper. He'd been one of my predecessors. And as he looked at that headline, he said to me, and I'll never forget it, it was really quite a lesson. He said, what would you, under those circumstances, what kind of type would you use for the second coming? <laughs> and, um, that, that, that was one lesson that I learned. <laughs> Incidentally, those were in the days when William Randolph Hearst was just starting uh, his yellow journalism, and I was probably influenced by that. And I was influenced in, uh, by Hearst in another way. We had a Sunday edition, which we put to bed late on Saturday night. And Hearst, in those days, nearly always put the picture of a, of, of a good-looking gal on the first page of his newspapers. And I thought that was a good idea. And I did that usually. And for this particular Sunday edition, I couldn't find any story that, that it included a, a woman, or at any rate, it did, there was a story that included a woman, but it didn't have any picture of her. It was a story that came from Denver about a fellow who had formerly lived up in the Cripple Creek District who had killed his gal on Lorimer Street in the Red Light District in Denver. And I printed the story, and the fellow who did the killing was the nephew of the then mayor of Victor. So I printed the mayor's picture. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the business manager of the paper was a fellow named Honest John White. And Honest John called me on the phone about 6 o'clock in the morning, and he said, Lowell, are you in bed? And I said, yes. And he said, you better stay there. 
He said, the mayor is looking for you with a gun. So I got up and dressed, and I went to the mayor's home, and he wasn't there, and I got in touch with his wife and, and squared things away. But anyhow, that was quite a lesson that I learned. I don't know much that I could tell you about Cripple Creek. Oh, there is one other thing. In those days, uh, there was a man named A.E. Carlton from Colorado Springs, who was a great power in this state. I think later on, not only in mining, but in the beet sugar thing and so on, A.E. Carlton was king. And he spent a lot of his time up in the Cripple Creek District. And he was one of the part owners of the paper. And at that time, I, uh, to vote, you had to be 21 years old. And I think I was only 19, maybe 20. And I was writing editorials telling people how to vote before I was eligible to vote myself. So A.E. A. E. Carlton used to get a young lawyer up in the Cripple Creek District named Ed Boughton, who was, well, he was reputed to be something of a con man. Uh, he got to Ed Boughton to write some editorials that he would send to me and ask me to print them. And uh, the thing about it that uh, interested me was this. Years later, when I went off with, to the First World War, I went to Chaumont in France to see General Pershing, to try and make some arrangements to do some things I wanted to do. And that reminds me of something. But anyhow, when I went into General Pershing's office, there in the outer office sat Ed Boughton from Victor, the uh, adjutant general of the American Army. And I thought that was really something. Oh, yes, about uh, General Pershing, I told him that uh, I had found, since I was quite young, and President Wilson and his cabinet had asked me to go over to Europe and spend some time and then come back and help to arouse the American people, because you're too young to know this, but President Wilson was re-elected into office on the platform that he was not going to take us into the war, whereupon shortly after he was elected into the war we went, partly because of the sinking of the Lusitania and other incidents. At any rate, the American people were not ready for it. And uh, so they asked me to go over and gather material and come back and help arouse America. And I went to General Pershing and told him that because of my youth, I was finding it a little, I had already had my trouble down in Italy. And it had worked out all right. But uh, I told him that uh, I, I found that I was running into a lot of red tape and that many people perhaps didn't take me too seriously because I looked so young, and uh, that I, I, well, did he have any suggestions? He said, yes, he had a general he wanted to get rid of. <laughs> he didn't put it in those words, said General Kelly, but the, the problem was here was a general who was the son of a former president of the United States, and he was an elderly man, and he wanted to be active in the war. And they really didn't have anything for him. So General Pershing turned him over to me to go with me. And it was really a great help, because when I found things were not working out exactly the way I wanted them to, I would say, by the way, I want you to meet the son of the President of the United States. And that helped a little bit, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm getting away from Cribble Creek now. I'm just trying to think if there's any incident up there uh, Marshall Sprague uh, wrote a, a lot in his famous book on Cripple Creek about a strike that we had up there in 1904, I think it was, Marshall. Uh, the Western Federation of Miners struck, and they were led by Moyer and Haywood. And uh, it was a very bitter strike indeed. And they had an assembly out in, in the main square in Victor one morning, and uh, my father knew that this assembly was going to be, take place, so he asked me to come to his office. I don't know why, but his office was directly across from this open area. And a cousin of mine, he asked him to come along with me also. We were both quite young, about 12 years old, I guess. And um, uh, shortly after this uh, crowd assembled there, a man, I think his name was Clarence Hamlin, got up on a wagon and made a speech that was a very fiery one. And immediately the shooting began. And um, I saw a man stand behind a telephone pole. I was looking 
My father made us get down on the floor, but I looked out the window anyhow, and I saw a man behind a telephone pole pump his, his, everything he had in his rifle into the crowd. And my father, uh, of course, then the shooting was over rather quickly. My father went down into the street and brought one of these wounded men up to his office and put him on the, I helped him put him on the operating table. And he operated on him and saved his life. And uh, while he was unconscious on the operating table, I took off his gun and put it behind a bookcase. And that's the only pay my father ever got for saving the man's life, was that gun that I had taken off of him, which is very unimportant, but just a, an experience that you have in a mining camp in those wonderful days. I left uh, Kerbal Creek not too long after that. Well, no, to go back for a moment to that particular period, in addition to this great uh, strike and the shooting that went on and so on, uh, I remember one morning when uh, one of the railway stations was blown up, you know, and all the miners that were on the station were killed. And it became one of the most celebrated cases in American history. It was done by a man named Harry Orchard. And it made uh, Senator Borrow of Idaho famous because he was involved in the case afterward. And then uh, I remember also one day when I was uptown in Victor and uh, a wagon came down from the Independence Mine and in it were 22 bodies of miners. These miners had been in the cage at the Independence Mine. You may never have heard of this, Marshal, but uh, the cage went up to the bull wheel and then something happened to it and it dropped over a thousand feet. And all the men on board, of course, were terribly torn to pieces and brought down, and I recall that. But the thing I was really going to tell you was about boxing, because in those days, um, our sports were different than they are today. Up there, we, uh, we played football. We played on, on fields that were covered with rocks. And uh, we didn't do very much skating, because the water all ran fast down a hill. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, the most popular sport was boxing. All of us spent a good deal of time boxing. And I took boxing lessons from the same man who taught Jack Dempsey with different results. <laughs> and years later, when I first went on the air, uh, our coach was an ex-pugilist named Morgan Williams. And when I went on the air, Morgan Williams, this was back in 1930, he heard me and he wrote to me. And he congratulated me on what I was doing, I guess. Anyhow, he said, he said that, Lowell, I have an assignment for you. He said, I used to have a fellow who worked out in my gym just as you did, but he got away with a pair of my gym trunks and gym shoes, and I'd like to have you get them back. His, his name is Jack Dempsey. <laughs> I had Jack on the air one night and told him all, all about this, and, and it worked out OK. Here's an interesting sidelight on that. Jack Dempsey never really had a boyhood. As you probably know, he was something of a tramp and a bum in his early years. And he didn't have uh, the opportunity to play games that, that most children have. And I had, I had a famous ball team at one time, notorious ball team, I'd better say. And uh, Jack Dempsey played on, on my team occasionally. And he had great difficulty because he had never played ball when he was a youngster. But since I've started to tell you about that, uh, that ball team, I might as well go on and explain to you that we were living in Dutchess County, New York. And incidentally, Dutchess County is the third county north of New York City. And it's the only county in America that I know of where both candidates for president of the United States in one campaign lived within a few miles of each other. Never in any other part of America did anything like that happen. The two, of course, were FDR and Tom Dewey. And uh, when, when FDR was elected president, it was at the time we were having great financial difficulties in this country. Right after the Depression, uh, there was a bank moratorium. The banks of America were closed. All the people of America were wondering what the next step was going to be and how FDR might pull us out of it, if he could. And FDR uh, went to his home up at Hyde Park in Dutchess County to spend the weekend. And he was accompanied by the largest number of correspondents who had ever gone anywhere with a president because of this nationwide interest.
wondering what FDR might do. And uh, it was a very hot weekend. It gets tremendously hot in the uh, Hudson Valley up around Poughkeepsie. And uh, out where I live in the hills, 20 miles east of there, it's much cooler. So some of my friends were among uh, the correspondents who were with FDR. And I called up the President's Secretary, uh, Colonel Marvin McIntyre, and I said, Mac, if some of the boys are suffering, why don't you bring a few of them over to my place in the hills where it's cooler? I thought he might bring perhaps a half a dozen. Well, they came 130 strong. <laughs> they all came, including FDR's sons and, and his daughter Anna. They all came. And in a very short time, they'd gone through all the liquor in our house. And to get them out of the house, I suggested a ball game. And uh, then I rounded up some of my neighbors, and we had a ball game. And a lot of these fellows hadn't played ball since they were youngsters, and some of them never had played. And when they got back to Hyde Park, they were still laughing about what had happened and incidents in connection with the game. And FDR heard about this, of course, from them and from his sons. So he called me on the phone, and he said, Lowell, I need a laugh also. He said, if it was as much fun as that, why don't you bring your team over here next week and do it all over again for my benefit? Uh, so I did. I brought my team over. But when we were on our way to Hyde Park, uh, someone with uh, some political acumen uh, got the president's ear and said to him, Mr. President, what do you think the people in the Bible Belt down in Ohio and so on are going to think about the president of the United States when they hear that he not only condones Sunday ball games, but has it on his own property. And FDR got the point. So he sent, uh, he sent Colonel Starling, the head of the Secret Service, out to scout in the neighborhood for some other place where the game could be played. And his, his, his number one political enemy at that time was uh, Ogden Reed, who had been President uh, Hoover's Secretary of the Treasury. Ogden Mills. And Ogden Mills was off on the first vacation he'd had in four years, and FDR said, let's have the game played on his property. <laughs> so um, we, we played the game on Ogden Mills' estate, and uh, FDR uh, put his own car on the first baseline, and he ran his team, and he took great delight in putting people in and yanking others out. He put Rex Tugwell, he put the members of his original brain trust in, Tugwell to pitch. And um, Harry Hopkins in center field, and so on. And I had one man on my team who was really quite a slugger, a big, powerful fellow. And I can still see him. He knocked a home run over the head of Harry Hopkins into an adjoining field. And Hopkins, I can still see him going over the fence after that ball. When he got over the fence, he found himself facing a bull. So seeing Harry Hopkins come back, that was, the, <laughs> that was the interesting part. Well, as a result, as a result of uh, what happened at that game, uh, the, the, there was no news in those days. So the correspondents all dashed to the telegraph office in Poughkeepsie and sent long stories to their papers. The New York Times carried a column on the first page. Uh, the New York Herald Tribune, Ernest Lindley, had a two-column article on page one. Uh, Colonel Frank Knox, at that time, owned the Chicago Daily News, one of the most powerful papers in America of that era. He wrote an editorial about the game in which he congratulated FDR on yanking Tugwell out of, as pitcher <laughs> and uh, saying that he should have yanked him out of the administration. <laughs> the story of our game went all over the world. It was even on the bulletin boards of ships at sea. And as a result of that, uh, we had an annual series that lasted almost until FDR's death. And every summer, his team would play against mine. I built a ball field for the games. And I remember one year when we had a bigger crowd than some of the major leagues had. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that's just one of those sidelights on, on life. You know, I beg your pardon? Oh. Well, that reminds me of something. <laughs> FDR never liked to lose. And when his he would take some of these 
uh, members of his cabinet who were in, he'd, he'd yank them out and he'd put Secret Service men in who had been semi-pro ball players. <laughs> Mike Flanagan and people like that, you know. And that reminds me of something. Uh, years later, the King of Saudi Arabia came to America during uh, President Eisenhower's administration. And uh, the King, King Saud, had in his entourage uh, a friend of mine named uh, Abdul Bulker. And uh, Vice President Nixon, he was the Vice President then, was ordered by President Eisenhower to, to put on a big luncheon at the Carlton Hotel in uh, Washington for the king and his whole entourage. And I thought I might find my friend Abdul Bulker there, and I went over to the Carlton. And as I went in, a big burly fellow grabbed me by the shoulders and said, Lowell, what are you doing here? It was one of the Secret Service men who had played against us in, the, in those games. And I explained to him that I was looking for a man who was probably with the king. And he said, well, maybe I can give you a little help. And he took me into a side room and I didn't know what he was going to do. Then he opened some doors and he gave me a push. And there I was in the room facing uh, the vice president and the king and about a hundred people who were sitting at a horseshoe table. And here I was directly facing them. <laughs> and you know, Nixon could have been angry uh, uh, under those circumstances. And I, I was surprised that he was not angry. Instead of that, he, he spoke up and he said, Lowell, I want you to come up here and meet the king. And when I walked around and he introduced me to King Saud, he said, King Saud, I want you to meet the American who probably knows more about Arabia than any other one in this country. And King Saud, yes, I know him. He was my guest out there a year ago. <laughs> and that reminds me of something. Uh, when I went to visit the king in Saudi Arabia back in the 50s, I think it was 1951, at that particular time, my son, was flying around the world in a small single-engine plane, and we met in the Persian Gulf at that particular time. And he flew me to Riyadh in, in uh, Central Arabia. And uh, when we got uh, to Riyadh, I was met by somebody from the king's palace, and he took me in. And uh, the king uh, turned me over to somebody else, and I found myself alone in a big palace not where the king lived, but another one. And I was there alone for an hour or so and getting rather fed up when suddenly the curtains opened and a man stepped in, who obviously an American, he was in American uniform, and he had his hands clasped in a rather funny way and he said, don't be too nervous, uh, Mr. LT, because this is nothing serious. You'll be properly taken care of. And he uh, turned out to be a chap who had been loaned to the king by the Aramco people to handle the king's minor fi uh, financial things. He was uh, from the account department of Aramco. And um, the, uh, there were several things that were rather odd about all this. The king gave a dinner for me in his palace the next night, and he gave it to me in a room that looked like the Hall of Mirrors in uh, Paris, outside Paris at Versailles, and that reminds me of something. You remember what Henry uh, Kissinger said a couple of years ago? He said, I was never so impressed in my life as I was when I stood alone in the Hall of Mirrors. <laughs> well, uh, well, anyhow, uh, Hall of Mirrors, and uh, the king sat at one end of the table, and they said it was always that way. No one ever sat beside him, which meant that the top of the table was comparatively narrow. And on uh, his left-hand side sat all the members of his cabinet and a lot of distinguished sheikhs, all in uh, Arabian costume. I sat on his right, just around the corner, and sitting next to me were the king's sons, 27 of them, <laughs> all according to their ages. And the king uh, asked me in the course, he had this man, Abdul Bulkir, as the interpreter. And that's why I was looking for Abdul Bulkir later on in America. Abdul Bulkir stood between the king and uh, me there at the head of the table. 
And uh, the king asked me how, how many sons I had. He knew that my son had flown me there from the Persian Gulf. And I said I only had one. And he said, well, he's, he's the number one son, the prime minister, or the, the, the crown prince spoke up and said, that's enough, one. <laughs> um, and what he was suggesting was that the, others, the other 26 were ganging up on him. <laughs> he never did get to be king, the, the crown prince didn't. Well, the king said to me, he said, stay around a while, I can arrange for you to have many more. <laughs> uh, and while we were sitting there at the table, uh, there was a glass of milk in front of my plate, and I made the obvious comment. I said, uh, being in Arabia, is this camel's milk? And they said, no, this is homogenized milk from the royal dairy. And then the king clapped his hands, and in about, about two minutes, camel's milk was at my plate. <laughs> and we had a, one of the things we had to, to eat that night was a, a, a bird. It was something like a turkey, but it was really uh, like a wild turkey, really, a bird that some of you may be familiar with called a bustard, B-U-S-T-R-D, bustard. And I got off a line that I thought was pretty good, but it, the king didn't quite get it. I said, is it a young bustard or an old bustard? <laughs> uh, well, anyhow, then I, they, they served us a very delicious uh, dessert. And I said, through admirable care, asked the king, what do you call this in Arabic? And the king said, we call it ice cream. What do you call it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I've just about used up my time. Great, Scott. So, uh, and I haven't told you very much about uh, Cripple Creek and Victor. The only thing I really have told you is that you're lucky to live in such a glorious place as Colorado Springs. And I'll, I'll conclude my rambling remarks with, with one other little bit. As some of you know, uh, I've been involved in radio for a long time. In fact, I still have a daily radio program, and I have a television show, and I have other things that I'm working on. But when I first went on the air, an American airman named Cy Caldwell, who's something of a cynic and a writer, he used to write for the Scripps Howard people. He had a column for a number of years. Uh, Cy Caldwell called me on the telephone. Now, when I first went on the air, I was fantastically lucky because when I went on, I preceded probably the two most successful entertainers perhaps in the entire history of the world. Amos and Andy. <laughs> you know, life in America almost stopped when Amos and Andy came on during some of those great years. And I was a lucky fellow to be put on the air directly in front of Amos and Andy. And Cy Caldwell called me on the phone, and he said, Lowell, when you die, they're going to put on your tombstone the following epitaph. Here lies the bird who was heard by millions of people who were waiting to hear Amos and Andy. <laughs> and, hold on.